ahora. Ελπίζω να με βλέπετε. Γεια σε όλους. Καλώς ήρθατε στο Angular Athens. Το πρώτο online meetup, το δέκατο στη σειρά uh, Angular Athens meetup. Uh, το meetup θα γίνει στα αγγλικά, λόγω του καλεσμένου μας, οπότε κάνω switch. Uh, so, welcome everyone to Angular Athens online meetup. Uh, meetup. Uh, small introduction. Uh, first, Uh, I hope all of you, everyone, is safe, healthy, uh, physically and um, mentally. So, uh, Manfred, the small introduction about Manfred. Manfred Steyer is a speaker, trainer, consultant, author, with focus on Angular, uh, a big, uh, you know, uh, a big help. Uh, on Angular community. So he's also a Google developer expert and Microsoft MVP. Manfred will uh, make a speech about domain-driven design and Angular. And uh, you can put your comments on the live feed of YouTube. And uh, at the end of the uh, Manfred's uh, speech, we will uh, transfer your Uh, questions and uh, he asked, he answered them. Uh, so, uh, at the end of the speech, we will uh, have a, qu a quiz and uh, we'll give, we'll have a giveaway for two tickets for Angular App uh, and uh, one online course by Maximilian for Angular, the complete guide. So also, you can join our Slack channel. Um, you can find the link at the Meetup page, and uh, you can follow us at uh, Twitter and Instagram. So I think Manfred is ready for his speech. Manfred, can you hear me? Yeah, perfectly. So Hello, thanks Manfred. for having me. Thank you very much. You're being here tonight, and you make this uh, speech for us. It will be very valuable. and. It's great uh, to share your knowledge with us, with the community. Thank you very much. Cool, great. So let's get started. Once again, thanks for having me and Carly Spira. Uh, this will be about sustainable Angular architectures with strategic design and an accent. Let me start with a question. What do you think, what does it need for a good architecture? An architecture that is sustainable, an architecture that is maintainable in the wrong long run. When you think about your projects, when you think about your experiences, what do you guess? Well, if you ask me, it takes a lot of experience and ideally experience from a diverse group of people. All those people shall sit together and discuss about a good solution. And besides this, there are some ways to accelerate this process. I found out you can give them caffeine to accelerate this, and you also can feed them with pizza. For this, I really recommend Pizza Provinciale, which is the pizza with ham and baking on it, also with corn. I only made good experiences with it. It works perfectly for architectural things. But besides pizza and caffeine, let's stick with experiences. Uh, people thought about how to share experiences. And so some people wrote down best practices. Other people took a more formal approach. They wrote down patterns. And other people took some best practices. They took some patterns and they added a philosophy. And so they ended up with having a full methodology. And such a methodology is domain-driven design. Perhaps it's the only methodology which is bridging the gap between your requirements and your good architecture. And today I want to answer one question, namely how to create sustainable angular architectures with ideas from domain-driven design. Here two words are important for me. The first word is sustainable. 
because here I'm not talking about something that helps us to create an Angular application quick and dirty. Here we speak about creating something that lasts for at least a decade. And so we have to invest a bit upfront. And the other thing is ideas. Because for me, domain-driven design is not a religion. For me, it is just a toolbox. And there are a lot of tools in there. And some tools are more useful and some tools might be less useful for your very goals. Saying this regarding the contents, first of all, I will show you my perspective towards domain-driven design. And then we will talk about mono repositories. At first sight, mono repositories don't have anything to do with domain-driven design. But at the end of this part, you will see both topics are two sides of the same coin. And so in the third part, I will show you how you can bring all this together how you can bring this together so that you have the methodology on the one side and a technical way to implement it on the other side. But first, let me introduce myself. I am Manfred. I am a train and consultant for Angular, and I'm doing a lot of trainings. My current training is an advanced training about Angular architectures for enterprise and industrial uh, applications. And normally I'm doing it in several cities. Nowadays, because of the current situation, I'm doing it mostly remotely. Today, I just had one of these workshops. Uh, I did it together with Angie Poland, and it really worked well. Working remotely is not that bad as you might think. Besides this, I'm also quite connected to the Angular community. I'm part of the Google Developer Expert Program, and I'm a trusted collaborator in the Angular team. Perhaps a little story about the word trusted collaborator, because I always have to laugh when I read this term. Uh, we in German have also the term collaborator, and it means exactly the same. Exactly the same, but always in a negative sense. A collaborator is someone who teams up, with others to destroy something. And well, if you look at my first pull request, it was about the German meaning of collaborating. Meanwhile, hopefully, I've reached the English meaning. Saying this, I am from Austria and I'm doing a lot of stuff in other countries uh, of Europe. I'm always happy if I can visit other countries. So let's get started with the first chapter, which is about domain-driven design. If you look at domain-driven design from a high-level perspective, you see at least two disciplines. There is strategic design on the one side, there is tactical design on the other side. Strategic design is mostly about decomposing a big system into tinier parts. And tactical design, it's more about design patterns and practices. If you observe the discussion about the perfect entity, the perfect repository, then this was about tactical design. For me, strategic design is the more important one because this one is really about architecture. Tactical design is more about traditional software design. So let's stick with this for the time being. If you ask me what strategic design is doing, I would say it prevents this very situation, a situation where everything is intermingled with everything else. If you have a situation like this, you cannot easily maintain anything. If you have a situation like this, then you have a situation where you change something there and destroy something here. And of course, this is not nice. This drives you nuts, and this is not what I think about when I talk about a maintainable software. So let's try to prevent this. To prevent this, domain-driven design tries to decompose a big system into tiny parts. So instead of writing a big e-procurement system, in domain-driven design, we would write several tiny systems, like a catalog system, 
like an approval system, like an ordering system, or like a specification system. In this application, the approval system is for the manager who says, no, you don't get this laptop. The ordering system is for the people who are writing the orders, who are sending out the orders to the best or cheapest vendors. And the specification system is for the ID department. They say, oh, you need a laptop. You get this one because you are a power worker and you get this tiny laptop because you are, I don't know, a manager or something else. So in domain-driven design, they call those parts subdomains. A subdomain is always one part which is use case driven. That's why authentication is not a subdomain. Authentication is not a use case. Authentication is something technically which is needed for use cases, but not a use case. No user would say, hey, my goal for today is to authenticate. No, they won't say that. They will say, my goal is to order something. And for this, they are using the catalog. Or a goal is to get uh, an order approved or to send out an order. And so this is always about use cases, about business processes. And now the big question is, how to identify such processes? And now the answer is perhaps an answer you don't like. Namely, you have to look at your business processes. Perhaps you don't like it because as a software architect, you deal a lot with technical stuff. As a software architect, normally you deal with a lot of techniques, with frameworks, with layering and so on. But in this case, you really have to look at the use cases. You really have to look at your business processes. Only so you can find out about your domains. Here in our case, perhaps we have an employee requesting a product, a new laptop. The ID expert is saying, hey, you need a MacBook because you are a software developer. The manager is saying, no, you only get this uh, cheap webbook and the buying agent is sending out the order to the vendors. Or there might be another process where one manager is saying, hey, I need more money, and the other manager is saying, of course, you can have all this money, or no, you don't get it, not you. Just by looking at these processes, you see there are several steps, and each big step can be part of a domain. Here it is that coarse grain that each step is more or less a domain of its own. So by looking at the process, you find out where to draw the line. Also, you have here different domain experts. And most of the time, a domain has its own experts. The ID expert is the expert of the specification domain. The buying agent is the expert of the buying domain. You can also look at the main entities. For instance, when it comes to requesting a product, of course, the product is in the center. When it comes to approving an order, of course, there is a product involved. But more important is here the budget and the hierarchy. The hierarchy which tells us which manager has to approve. The product here is perhaps only a string and a number the name of the product and the price. Here, the product is something that's quite huge. Pictures, Q&As, ratings, different prices, different discount levels, and so on and so forth. So by looking at the processes, by looking at the involved people, by looking at the main entities, you can find out about your domains. And when you have found your domains, you can put them into a context map. This context map shows you which domain needs to interact with each other domain. In a perfect world, the domains would not know anything about each other. In a perfect world, they would be completely isolated. Because in this case, you can change something here without breaking that domain in a perfect world. In this world, of course, they have to communicate sometimes with each other. For instance, 
it is likely that all those domains need product data from the catalog. But having something like this relaying on the catalog from within each and every domain is not a good thing. Because if you change something here, you break all the other domains. And for sure, you don't want this. So you need a better way. And domain-driven design is really giving you some better ways. One way is introducing a shared kernel. A shared kernel is just a shared library or a bunch of shared libraries which are used by all the domains. It is not the last word on this. Uh, some people don't like it because the shared kernel is owned by everyone. And you know, when something is owned by everyone, then at the end of the day, it is owned by no one. If everyone is responsible for something, no one is responsible for it. Just think about cleaning up in a shared flat. If everyone is responsible for cleaning up, you can think about how this flat looks like. We always say, it, well, the person who thinks it's dirty shall clean it up. So no one thought it's dirty and no one cleaned it up. So the big issue here are the responsibilities and this leads to breaking change. A better strategy is introducing an API. An API which is exposing a tiny amount of features for other domains. Not everything, just a tiny amount. As little as possible. And only those things need to be backwards compatible. The rest can be changed, the rest can be thrown away, rewritten, it can be bought from a third-party vendor, or it can be left away. It does not matter as long as the API is backwards compatible. In domain-driven design, they call this open or host service. I am calling it API because, you know, the term service has a different meaning in Angular and service does not fit this black box here. API does, so I'm sticking with the term API. Saying this, if you look into domain-driven design, you find a lot of additional approaches for cross-domain communication. You even find a lot of additional patterns. But for the time being, let's stick with this. This was the one side of the coin. This was our methodology, which, which is about subdividing a big application into tiny parts, which know as little about each other as possible. Now, let's talk about a technical topic. Let's talk about monorepos. A monorepo is, at first sight, just a big repository, a big folder structure holding all of your projects, or let's say all of your uh, partial projects, all of the parts that make up your project. In my case, I could have an approval library for the manager, a catalog library, an e-procurement application, and a validation library. Everything goes into this folder structure. Saying this, this is not intended for libraries that are distributed. This is intended for libraries you use to subdivide a big application into parts. And one of the best things is this node modules folder. Not that it is here, but that it is here just once. Because that means you have only one version of Angular, one version of Redux, one version of Bootstrap. Just think about having Angular 5 here and Angular 9 there. And then you try to compile everything together. I guarantee you all hell would break loose. And this is prevented by having just one node modules folder by design. This brings some advantages. There are no version conflicts. Everyone is using the same versions. Also, the latest versions of your libraries, because your libraries are co-located with the rest of the system. They are co-located in this big folder. And there is no burden with distributing libraries. If you used NVM libraries, you would have to implement a library. 
This involves writing the library, assigning a version number, publishing the library. Then you have to install the library into your application, integrate it, and of course you will find out that there is a bug. You have to file the bug, you have to move over to the library, check out the library, you have to fix the bug, you have to assign a new version number, you have to publish the library, install it into your application, and sooner or later you will just drive nuts. So as you see here, using NPM for this purpose is not the best solution. The monorepo helps you to prevent this situation. Saying this, creating a workspace is really easy. You can use the Angular CLI to new up a new workspace. And within this workspace, you can generate applications and libraries. You can serve your applications and you can build both applications as well as libraries. When you are not sure if you should go with mono repos or not, let me tell you one thing. It is not a one way street. You can move back and forth all the time. Let's assume you have this pretty mono repository with a validation library. And now you want to share the validation library with other projects in other repositories. No one prevents you from extracting this library to an NBM registry. And so you get the best of both worlds. You have the validation library source code as part of your repository. That means it can grow and evolve alongside your application and you can share it with other project teams. This is exactly how Angular is developed. Angular is developed in a mono repository. And this makes sure that Angular Core version 9 works together with Angular Common and Angular Forms version 9. And when they are done, they are pressing a button and the rest of us can get the libraries using NBM. If you like the idea of mono repositories, you will love NX. NX is what I'm calling the sugar dip on top of the Angular CLI. It enhances the Angular CLI. I'm always saying it teaches the CLI new tricks. This here is one trick. It allows you to visualize your project structure. This is very important for big software applications because this allows you to assure yourself that not everything is in the mingle with everything else. If here everything would be connected to everything else, you would have a highly coupled solution, which is not easy to be maintained. There are some other features of NX we will look into in a second. How to create an NX workspace? Well, just use NPM in it. Instead of ng new, use npm init and x workspace. This downloads a script which is creating a new workspace on your machine. This workspace is a traditional CLI workspace and it has some additional features, but it's really the Angular CLI and that's why you can still use ng generate, ng serve, or ng build. Okay, now we have seen two different things, a methodology and a technical way for organizing a big application. And now let's try to bring both sides together. Let's talk about NX mono repos and strategic design. If you wanted to create a strategic design with an NX mono repo, I would start with creating folders. One folder per domain. And then I would create a shared folder for the shared kernel. After that, I would start with filling those folders with libraries. And to make it a bit more, uh, a bit easier for us, the NX team defined several categories of libraries. From Angular's perspective, there is no difference. But from our perspective, those categories help us to see the big picture. The first category is the feature category. A feature library holds smart components. A 
a smart component is a component which knows your use cases. It knows what the user needs to do to reach a specific goal. And because it aligns with your use cases, it is not that much reusable. It is written for one specific case. On the other side, you have this UI layer with UI libraries, and they contain dump components. A dump component does not know anything about your use case. Nada, nothing, niente, nulla, nothing at all. It does not know nothing. It does not know anything. And because it does not know anything, it is really reusable. Just think about a date time picker. A date time picker knows nothing about your use case. It does not even know what kind of date it is displaying. But because of this, it is reusable. You can use it with each and every other feature which is doing something with dates. Or think about an address component, which is part of lots of business products. It is just used to make sure addresses are displayed in a common way, but it does not know about your use cases. The next layer has several names. Some people refer to it as the domain libraries. Some people refer to it as data libraries because it's also holding data structures and data access code. Some people call it the state layer because it's also responsible for state management. I call it the domain layer because it contains my domain model, which is here in the case of Angular, my client-side data model with flights, with passengers, and so on. And then there is a utility layer with utility libraries. A utility is not use case specific, and most of the time it's something technical, like converting strings to dates and vice versa, authentication or locking, something like this. The best thing about this is you can introduce access restrictions. For instance, you could define that one layer is only allowed to access layers below. In this sense, feature would allow to access the rest. Domain would only be allowed to access you. The second access restriction is the more important one for me. It's about restricting the access between domains. In this case, the catalog domain is only allowed to use catalog libraries and to use shared libraries. Ordering is only allowed to use ordering libraries and shared libraries. But ordering is not allowed to use something from within catalog. We are restricting the access to prevent that everything is highly coupled to everything else. Besides this, this architecture brings a lot of order into the system. Because now there are less discussions about where to put something or where to find something. If it is a feature for selecting a product, then it comes into the feature layer of the catalog domain. If it is, let's say, an um, order entity, then it comes in the domain layer of ordering. So there is less discussion, and so you will find your stuff more easily. Um, besides this, um, perhaps you are saying, yeah, that looks nice. I have a clean architecture, everything has its place, and I have access restrictions, but this looks that overwhelming. That's really overwhelming, all those boxes. Well, it's not that overwhelming because, as you see here, it is not a full rectangle. I have grayed out some of those boxes, and I have done this because most of the time, we only have feature libraries and domain libraries in the real domains. And we have reusable UI libraries, you remember, dump components, and utilities as part of the shared kernel. And so this is not a full rectangle. You don't have to create that many libraries. Now I've skipped some slides. So another thing I want to talk about is the shared kernel. I already told you the shared kernel has some downsides namely responsibilities. 
if everyone is responsible for it, you know, no one is responsible. But there is another downside. Just imagine you want to share a feature component. And so you pull it into the shared kernel. But of course, if you look into this feature component, you will find out it depends upon other components. And so you also have to pull the other components into the shared kernel, also the services it depends upon. And these dependencies, of course, will have further dependencies. And so you also have to pull those dependencies into shared. And if you don't take care, you end up with having two thirds of the whole system in the shared kernel. And of course, if you have two thirds of the whole system in the shared kernel, this does not make sense anymore. Your vertical slicing does not make sense because you still have this big monolithic situation. You just moved it into shared. So please prevent this situation and you can prevent it by introducing an API. An API in that sense is just a little library, a very small library, which is just exposing specific stuff from one domain for other domains. For instance, it might expose the product service for the ordering domain. And so an ordering feature can make use of it. The big thing here is, and the important thing is, only what gets exported via this API needs to stay backwards compatible. The rest can change without breaking other domains. You see, it's always about changing something without breaking other domains. I've talked about this. Let me just tell you one thing about the domain. Uh, the theory tells us to isolate the domain. And that means we will put something in front of the domain and something behind it. In the middle, our domain model will uh, stick. And these are our entities together with some general purpose business logic. For instance, domain specific validation logic or some tiny calculations you need to do on the client side. Of course, the majority of uh, business logic will be on the server side, but sometimes you need business logic in the client just to improve the usability, just to calculate something immediately or to validate something immediately. This is here. If you don't like the term entity, you can also call it a client-side data model or a client-side model. For me, the term entity is okay, even though it's highly used in the backend, because for me, a modern single page application is more than the receiver of data transfer objects. For me, a single page application is a place where a rich model, a rich entity model materializes. Perhaps not at once, but by means of lazy loading and state management, it materializes step by step, little by little. The infrastructure layer is about data access, about talking to your backend, and the optional application layer consists of facades. A facade is just a tiny service orchestrating everything for one use case. That means your feature component does not need to know all the 50 classes in here. It only needs to know one facade. And this facade will communicate with the rest. This facade will orchestrate the rest. This facade will coordinate the rest. So writing new features will become really easy. Also, this facade is responsible for state management and it hides the details of your state management. That means you can get started with subjects and entities. And at some later point in time, you might switch to NGRX. You do it behind the facade. And that's why the rest of the system will not notice that you just switched out subjects for NGRX. This is an architecture that can grow. 
And this is for me a criteria for a good architecture. For me, a good architecture is not an architecture that contains everything upfront. This would be an over-engineered architecture. A good architecture is an architecture that allows you to do your decisions as late as possible. Because if you do your decisions as late as possible, you have as many information as possible. And so you can do your best decisions. If you do decisions without inf information, without knowledge, without experiences, then you will very likely do a wrong decision. And I think that's why facades are quite popular in the area of Angola. Uh, there are several blog posts about it, and it really fits well into the world of domain-driven design. Domain-driven design has it for about 20 years. Okay, enough for the theory. Let's get started with a demonstration. And for this, I'm moving into a mono repository. It's an, an X repository, which is using this strategy, strategic design. There is an apps folder and the lips folder, and you can guess what they are for. The apps folder consists of an application. Here it is just one application. It's called UI. You see, I'm very creative. It's a deployment monolith. Saying this, you don't need to do monoliths. Here it's a monolith, but it could also be one application per domain, one ordering application, one catalog application, one approval application. The more interesting directory is the libraries directory. It consists of one folder per domain, catalog, ordering, and there is shared. If we look into catalog, we see several libraries. For instance, two feature libraries, one domain library, one API. So let's have a look into a feature, feature browse products. If we look in here, there is an index.ds. Some people also call it public API because this is what it is. It is the public, the public API of your library. That means everything you are exporting here can be used by other libraries in your domain. And so what you export here should be backwards compatible somehow. Everything you don't export here don't need to be backwards compatible. It won't break other libraries. This is an important aspect of a stable architecture. So besides this, there is, of course, um, an Angular module in there. I'm calling it Catalog Feature Browse Products module. And of course, it needs my domain module. Here it is, Catalog Domain Module. I need to import it because I need its services. And one of the nicest things here is you can use nice names. You don't have to go with dot, dot, slash, dot, dot, slash, dot, dot, slash, dot, dot. I guess you know this situation. No, you don't need it. Instead, you can go with nice names. Those names look like the names of NBM packages, but honestly, they are just map names and X is mapping those names within your DS config JSON. Here you have a mapping for all your libraries. So you can go with a short, meaningful name, which is quite nice. It also allows you to change something if you want to compile a special version of your application, a special version for customer A. Well, besides this, it's a traditional Angular project, besides splitting it into domains and libraries. And now let's use one of the features of NX. For this, let's run the script step graph. This is baked into NX. Oh, OK. I have already a web server running. It starts a web server, so let me close all my windows. Now it takes some time. 
And here we are. We see our beautiful architecture. There is an end-to-end -end testing application. Well, we are not that interested into it, but here the interesting stuff begins. We have our UI application and it is using several uh, libraries from different domains. Now let's copy this out. Let's do a screenshot and copy it into OneNote. I've already prepared a very secret sheet here. And yeah, let's go to full screen mode. Let's zoom in a little bit more. Okay. Yeah, looks almost good. Yeah. Okay. And now we can paint a bit. That's the funniest part of this presentation. Let me paint. If you look here and you have the domain logic from ordering, or if you look there, you see a feature from the catalog domain or another feature from the catalog domain. Oui, that was clumsy. Or the catalog domain logic or even the API of the catalog exposing selected things for other parts of the system. Or if we look a bit further, we see one library from the shared kernel and another library from the shared kernel. And just by looking at this, you can say, you can tell that one domain is not easily accessing other domains. This is forbidden. If one domain needs to access something that's shared, it has to use the shared kernel, like here or there, or it has to go via an API. Everything else is forbidden. In all the other cases, the domain is only allowed to talk to itself. And so we are really implementing strategic design where a change here cannot easily destroy something there. But now let's try something evil. Let me be the evil guy once in a time. I really like this. Let me break our architecture by accessing the UI layer from within the utility layer. If you remember my layering, this is strictly forbidden according my rules. Because in my layering, utility was on the bottom. UI was a bit above. It was not totally on the top, but it was above utility. And I told you, in this architecture, we are only allowed to communicate uh, from up to down, from top to bottom. Top, top, top down. Yeah, top down is the uh, term. We are only allowed to communicate top down. We are not allowed to communicate bottom up. But here I'm communicating bottom up. I'm driving against, against the one way. So let's look how NX will react. For this, let's move into the shared util of module. Let's remove these comments, which are importing the UI library. And check, we are getting a slap into the face. And an X is telling us that a utility library, look here, a utility library is only allowed to access other utility libraries. Accessing UI libraries from within utilities is strictly forbidden. We also can get this on the command line. Just link your project. And you get the same, um, the same error message. Yeah, here it is. I was never that happy for getting an error message. It also tells me that a utility can only access other utilities. And I even like this more because uh, something like that can be automated. It can be put into your CI process. And so you will immediately find out if someone checked something in that breaks your architecture. And then of course, please send out an email to everyone. Hey, Manfred broke your architecture. Please go to him and help him to grow his awareness. So there are several strategies for helping people grow their awareness.
but please always be nice. Okay, cool. A lot of nice features in here. There are some additional features who are also cool. For instance, an X comes with a feature called affected build. This is only building the affected parts of your changes. It looks into your Git history, it finds out what you have changed, and only the affected libraries and affected applications will be rebuilt. Meanwhile, an X is really capable of incremental compilation. It was one of the latest features. Now you can reuse already compiled libraries that have not been changed. So just let me show you a thought experiment. Let us delete everything in here. Where is the wrapper? Here it is. Go away, go away, go away. No. So, just imagine you change this. Because of this, also this one here is affected. Of course, because this one depends on this. And also the application is affected. And now, since the latest versions, NX only needs to recompile this and it can reuse the rest. They even have a cache so that you can grab the compiled versions of your colleagues. You don't even have to compile it a second time, which is quite a nice feature. It saves you a lot of time. Affected build. Affected test is just executing the unit tests of the affected libraries and affected end-to-end, -end, yeah, guess three times. Affected apps tells you the apps that have been affected and those are the apps you have to redeploy in your CI process. Perhaps you're saying, yeah, that looks nice. We have access restrictions, we have path mappings, we have incremental compilation, everything has its place, but this is that overwhelming. And let me tell you one thing, it's not overwhelming at all because it does not matter if you write ng-generate module, or if you write anti-generate library. The same effort for you, but uh, NX is doing the heavy lifting. So let us create a new library, anti-generate library, feature compare. Perhaps I want to compare two products, a cheap MacBook and a expensive MacBook. And this is for the domain uh, ordering. Shoot, now it takes some time. It takes some more time. And now you see, everything has been generated for me. My index.ts, my public API, my module. And now I can already fill this folder with my beautiful logic. Or as I'm always saying, now I have only to implement this feature. It is already there. I just need to fill this folder. Nice. So as you see, using this strategy is really easy. So just let me repeat why we need so many fine grand libraries. We need them because uh, they are the unit of recompilation, the unit of retesting because they allow us to define fine-grained access restrictions. We have information hiding. Each library can have a public API and everything else is a secret of the library. And having secrets is vital for a good software architecture because having secrets allow you to change something afterwards. And it is an alternative for ng-module that might to become optional. The Angular team never wanted them, they needed them, but they are investigating ways to make them optional now as we have Ivy. Optional doesn't mean they will go away because if they would be removed, that would be a breaking change. And you know, we did not make that many good experiences with breaking changes, that's why they will become optional. Also using ng-generate library is easy. 
So there is no reason to generate modules, just generate libraries. If you're saying, yeah, it's easy, but nevertheless, I have to do some steps time and again, then you are right. And that's why I want to encourage you to look into NX plugins. They allow you to extend the CLI with your own logic. And this is what I did. I implemented a plugin which is called Angular Architects DDD. Of course, DDD stands for Domain Driven Design. And this is generating the whole structure we need. So let me have a look into my console. Let me install it and she add Angular Architects Arch slash ddd which of course takes one or the other second but as i learned in Faliraki in my holiday siga siga i hope i pronounced it the right way siga siga i'm a really patient person Come on, <laughs> come on, <laughs> speed up, yeah. And now, after installing it, I don't have the best connection. I'm sitting here on the countryside. I can say, hey, please create a new domain. When it comes to ordering, it would be nice. Let me look it up, yeah, to have an approval domain. Would that be nice? Let's create an approval domain. Approval. Okay, and this is generating the domain layer for us. This is also configuring everything so that my access restrictions will be honored. You need to configure two files to get those access restrictions I have presented before. Then I can say, now let's create a feature within the approval um, domain. Let's call it check requests. And it's part of the domain approval. The entity for it is called request. And it's part of the app UI. This is my monolithic application. I could even create an own application for it. But for the time being, let's go with the monolithic one. OK. This creates everything I need here. For instance, I got a module, a approval module. I got a facade, I got a request entity, I even got a data service and a check requests component HTML, and also my access restrictions are honored. Now let's add another feature because it's that much fun. Let's call it request budget. The domain is approval, the request is a budget request. And yeah. And now let's create a dependency graph. Let me double check if the web server is down. Let's close the old web server. That graph calls, creates a web server, instantiates a web server. And now we have something that's really beautiful. If you look here, we have our own domain, which is the own branch of the UI application. Our own domain with one feature, another feature, and the domain logic here. And it's decoupled from the rest. And please remember, you can even define an own application for an own domain which leads to the topic of micro front ends. But that's another topic, quite a huge one. So let's stick with this for the time being. Okay, so the approval feature check library is also creating a dummy component, a dummy component which is proving that everything is wired up correctly. We could call this dummy component, but oh, let's let's keep it. I think you can imagine 
how difficult it is to call a component. Let me just show it to you slightly. Let's move to my home component. No, no home component. To my app component. And here I could call a component which is called feature check, I guess, or approval check. Approval for check request. So as you see here, I'm getting even the suggestions for it that proves that everything is already wired up, which is kind of nice, isn't it? Oh, let's let's start it. I think we have the time. That's the nice things at Meetup. We have a plenty of time and we have a start. Cigar, cigar. Normally, this is a good time to tell some jokes. As an Austrian, I'm always telling Austrian jokes in Germany because Germans really love jokes about Austrians. And because I'm Austrian, it's okay, I guess. And here we go. Locally host, 4,200. And yeah, it is hidden here. This is my generated component, which proves that everything works end to end across all my layers. Okay, let's take this out. Nice. So if you like this demonstration and if you like this topic, perhaps you will also like my free ebook. It's about the topics I've talked about today, but it's also about further topics like micro frontends which would be the next step here in such an architecture or which could be the next step if it is beneficial for your needs. So check it out. You can download it on my blog, angulararchitect.io slash book. Okay, let me sum up. What did we see today? We have seen that slicing everything into subdomains is beneficial because it allows us to decouple the parts of our software system. The same holds true for layers, feature, UI, domain, and so on. We have seen that fine-grained libraries help a lot. They are the unit of recompilation, and they allow us to define access restrictions. Also, we can automate repetitive steps so that we don't need to do the same things time and again. And there is a last thing I always want you to remember. If you forget about everything, please always remember this one little tiny aspect, namely, you can accelerate a software architecture process by feeding them with caffeine and pizza. And, you know, I really recommend Pizza Provenziale, which is the pizza with corn, ham, and bacon on it. I only made good experiences of it. So thanks for this. Here you have my contact data. You will find all my material in my blog. And if you like, follow me on Twitter so that we can stay a bit in contact. Thank you and Fharisto. I hope that was pronounced in the right way and I did not insult anyone. Fharisto. Thank you. Thank you, Manfred. Very interesting speech. Uh, and uh, architectural perspective. Thank you very much for the talk and uh, you have having you to, tonight. Uh, yeah, now we will switch with uh, Aris to for a QA. and a Aris, are you ready? Yes, can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. Okay, hello, my friend. Thanks very much Hi. for your talk. It was very interesting. Thank you. So let's get started with some interesting questions. Uh, the first one is, what folder structure would you suggest for a domain-driven design? The folder structure. So um, can you put on my screen again? Is that possible? Uh, yes. Great, thank you. So 
first of all, I'm using this folder structure with libraries. I have per domain, per subdomain, a subfolder. And here I have per library, another subfolder. And libraries from within the same layer have the same prefix so that I see them next to each other. That's the first point. Then within the feature, I would uh, manage everything according to use cases, according functional things like this use case, that use case. That is not possible within the domain layer. Here I have another uh, structure, and this structure really fits well into the world of domain-driven design. There is an infrastructure layer which has all the data services data services which would normally communicate with the backend using HTTP. Here I have some sample code in here. This is generated. The entities folder contains my domain model, my request entity, and some logic that operates upon it. If I have domain logic, like validation logic, like let's say validate request, chat request, let's type it. I have to have that much time. It's always false, so I'm optimistic. And the application layer contains my facades. There is one facade per, uh, per use case, and this facade is orchestrating everything. That means the component only needs to know the facade. And one of the nice things of the facade is it can hide state management. For the time being, it uses a behavior subject, but I could easily exchange it by a store, doing something like, you know, this dot store dot fetch this, fetch that, and the rest of the system will not ever recognize. So this allows me to introduce the enter X store just on demand. Yeah, this is the structure I use within and domain library. And as mentioned, it really fits well to the ideas of domain-driven design. And it also fits to best practices because using facades is one best practice in Angular. Saying this, they are optional. If you really love NGRX and if you know you will always use NGRX, then NGRX can be your facade. Otherwise, go with this. Right, thanks very much. Uh, let's get another one. Would you suggest to have a dedicated team work in its domain, in the domain-driven design? Or uh, is this going to become too narrow-sighted at some point in the future? I'm not totally sure if I got what you mean. OK. Uh, if, uh, would you suggest to have one team on each domain ah, when you're working? Yeah. Now, now I understand. Um, it's not a prerequisite, but if you have several teams, I would split them uh, according to the domain borders. This is the recommended approach. We also have this in um, microservices and micro frontends, because in this case, one team can work in an autarkic way on their own domain, and they cannot that easily harm the other teams. So the answer right. is yes, would be a good fit if you have several teams. So uh, uh, what do you think is the preferred size for a smaller domain that you can divide your application into? I mean, how far, how, how low can you can go yeah. in this domain-driven design? Yeah, good question. I think there is not a definitive number. It's not a law of nature. But if I think on my projects, one domain has up to 30 entities, plus minus. So perhaps that's, that's a rule of thumb. But I have another rule of thumb. It has to be big enough so that the use cases fits into one domain. Because if one use case is overlapping the boundaries of different domains, it's really difficult, then everything is intermingled. Let's say I want to do one thing, I'm under pressure, 
and they have jumped from one domain to the other domain. Everything is intermingled and it's not a good user experiment. So most of the user journeys should fit into one domain. And of course, ideally, it should not be too big because ideally it should be little enough, small enough that one team can work on it. Okay. Uh, what can we put in the libs folder uh, of the NX workspace except services? Uh, I think I noticed that uh, you had also some smart and dumb components inside there. Is this correct? Yeah, that's correct. So a feature contains uh, components. That means I would put all the components in there I need for a specific use case. Okay. Also, of course, uh, services, as you mentioned, also pipes. At the end of the day, everything I need for a use case. That means the application itself is just an envelope, an envelope which is wrapping all the features. Right. Okay, next question. We have a lot of questions for you to, tonight. I have a plenty of time. <laughs> okay. Do we need to configure a linter ourselves to check access between applications and libraries, or does a next do it automatically based on the repository structure? Yeah, you have to configure the linter, that's true, but it's not that difficult. So you need to assign categories to your libraries which are just strings. And then you can use those strings, those categories to introduce access restrictions. You can say a category or a library in the category feature is allowed to access everything. And a library in the category utility is only allowed to access other utilities. Right. Uh, would you suggest a monorepo architecture when you develop a, a web application that is going to be an actual SDK application for another developer? Ah, yeah, good question. So yes and no. I think I would start, I mean, there, there are two flavors to this. One flavor is to have one monorepo for all your SDK libraries. Perhaps your library or SDK is split among several libraries. And in this case, a monorepo can come in handy. Another flavor is where you have your first product that is using the SDK. And it can be beneficial to put the SDK for some time into the same mono repository. Because in this case, the SDK can be tested and can evaluate can be evaluated against your application. But that just works at the beginning. And also this application will drive the, the maturity of your the maturity of your SDK. Because it's always bad if you are uh, flying without seeing anything. That happens if you develop an SDK in isolation. But of course, sometimes later, you need an own mono repository for this SDK, which could be a design library. In many cases, I've seen people writing design systems, implementing design systems nowadays. So to put it in a nutshell, to get started, yes, you can co-locate it, but later I would split it out to a library of its own. Right. So is it conceivable that we can employ a message bus or a message broker to set up communication between different domains in the front end? Yeah, that's a good idea because domains shall be loosely coupled to each other. And um, the loosest form of communication is message passing. Just um, raising an event an event that says, hey, a customer was selected, or hey, your product has been approved. And then the other domains can act upon it or not. So that's the best form to communicate between the boundaries of your domains. And for getting started, you can use an observable or a subject for this. Right. So, two more questions. Uh, 
What was this green icon on your VS Code editor in the top left corner? Is it some kind of a plugin? The green icon or this one? I think this is Visual Studio Live Share. Uh, we are using it for remote workshops and it allows me to uh, connect to your machine and to do uh, bare programming together with you, even though we are not co-located. All oh, right. I thought that the live serve had a different icon. Is it the live serve plugin from Microsoft? Uh, I guess, yeah, I guess. Right. Just asking because I also use it for purpose. Okay. 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 Right. Uh, what are uh, pros and what are advantages and disadvantages when putting facades inside the store or outside? Yeah. Uh, the person that is asking this says, I, I'm currently putting my facades inside the store, but, th but I think of taking them out of the store and putting them into the application domain. He's, mm -hmm. currently, he's currently using NGRX for this, for the store. Okay. Yeah, so I would also put it to the store. I think it's the same. So if I can switch to my slide again. Let me look up the right slide. Here we go. I, yeah, I'm online. Um, I mean, this domain layer is also the layer where I would put the store into. And it would also be the layer where uh, my facade is. So it is funny, but in the workshop I did today, we did exactly this. Let me look it up. Um, yeah, I think it was that folder. So here I have, it's about flight bookings. I have too many projects, don't ask me why. And in lips I have luggage. Was it luggage? No. It was booking, booking a flight. And here I have my domain layer. And here I have a Ford folder, which consists of all, which contains all my Ensure X stuff booking actions and booking effects and the booking reducers, booking selectors. And my facade is now just delegating to NGRX. It is using the store to get out some data. It is using dispatch to dispatch an action to trigger some effects and so on and so forth. So I, I guess we are talking about the same. Okay, that's all I've got for tonight. Thank you very much for answering and our thank questions. thank you for having me. It was really great to be part of uh, this meetup. Thank you. Okay, let's switch now to the quiz, I think. George. Yeah, yeah. thank you, guys. Thank you. Uh, now we will proceed with uh, the quiz. John, are you ready? Yes. Yes, hello. All right, uh, so great speeds, great questions. So let's proceed now to the quiz uh, where we have uh, two tickets for Angular app and also a whole Angular online Angular course. Uh, so it will be a Kahoot quiz. So let me share, share the quiz. Hold on. Uh, the three first will get uh, the gifts, the two first, the tickets for Angular app, and the third, the online course. Okay, I hope it's uh, visible to everyone. So you need to open uh, kahoot.it and uh, put this game in. Uh, also make sure to 
not close the game after. And take a screenshot, so if you are on the top three, you share the screenshot with us via the Angular Meetup page or via uh, the Angular Slack, so we can uh, get to you and uh, uh, give you the gift. Of course, the questions of uh, the quests were provided by Manfred, so thank you as well for providing the questions. Right, we are already in 23. Let's wait a bit more. You can even open this via your mobile phone or web browser. So Kahoot will determine a score based on your accu accurately answering the questions, but also on your, on your speed. So the faster and also the most accurate will win. Each question has a time limit, around 60 seconds. All right, let's wait one more minute since people are uh, still joining. Don't overthink your nickname, or else you're not gonna make it in time. And there will be a, a total of five questions. Okay, 33 players. Let's wait a bit more, 34. Let's begin. Get ready. Do the warm up and let's go. So, domain driven design in Angular. Five questions. Question number one What's a goal of strategic design? Is it subdividing a system into subdomains? Is it applying as many design patterns as possible? Is it setting up a monorepo? Or is it applying patterns like facades? Press the correct color in the app. Okay, 20 seconds remaining. 30 answers, we missed four people. All right, correct answer is subdividing a system into subdomains. That's uh, what the whole speech was about. So let's go to the next question. Uh, first, the faster one was uh, Kleanos. Second one, Dimi and Humbleworm. Let, let's go. What's a way to allow one domain to use parts of another one? Is it using a Jeffrey's cube? Is it using symbolic links? Using a shared kernel? or selecting a library within the dependency graph. A way to allow one domain to use parts of another one. Thank you. 
and it is using a shared kernel. The shared kernel is the way of uh, that the one domain can use the parts of the other domain. So let's see the score. Can Hamworm has taken the lead? Must Darius and Tassos in the third place and second place. All right, let's go. Next question. What are some advantages of using NX with fine-grained libraries? They allow to benefit, they allow us to benefit from a known NG module and entry components. They allow one fine-grained module per domain and one component, which is the lonely component pattern. We save space in the disk and make it easier to defragment, or they allow to access restrictions and incremental retesting. So the advantages of using an X is that we have access restrictions, so not everyone can access everything. And we also have incremental retesting in our application. So let's go to scoreboard. Must Darius, first one, AS, second one, and Spithas, the third. Let's go to the next question. Fourth question, second to last. What's the benefit of the presenting facades? Is it shielding domain and state management details? Is it the, to enforce layering? Is it that is looks nice in independency graph? Or is it to hide components? The benefit of the presented facades. So much suspense, let's see. Five seconds left, hurry up. Benefit of the presented facades is to is shielding your domain and state management details. So let's go and see the scoreboard. Mastarius is the first one. Spithas second one. Rock and Roller is the third. All right, let's go to the last question. Five out of five. What's an advantage of a monorepo? It helps with escaping Rura Penthe. It allows performance optimizations at runtime. It prevents the need for versioning, publishing, and installing libraries, or it's the basis for a positronic brain. What is the advantage of a monorepo? Will it help us escape Rura, Rura Pente? And the answer is that it prevents the need for versioning publishing and installing libraries. So it makes, in essence, development a lot more linear and faster. So let's see the results. Let's go. Da -da -dun -da -dun. Third one was Double T. Second one was Rock and Roller. And the winner is Mas Darius. Congratulations. Very nice. Runner-ups was 
D and Leon. So uh, send us a message uh, in the either via the meetup page in the Angular Athens meetup or in the Angular Athens Slack, and uh, with a screenshot uh, of your screen right now, which you are one of the three winners, and we will get back to you about the gifts. Thank you so much for participating and uh, being here. All right, and uh, George, you can take it back. Yeah, John, thank you. Congrats uh, for the winners. And uh, yeah, we'll proceed also with John. Uh, have a small surprise for us, John. Uh, so okay. yeah. Yeah. So proceeding, I will uh, also show a small video uh, uh, about the Angularians. Angularians is a, is an effort made by uh, funny scenarios to Angular Athens coordinators. So let me present the video. Κομπλέ, πάμε. Γεια σε όλους. Είμαστε Angularians, ο Άρης και ο Φάνης. Ή ο Φάνης Κράτης. Είμαστε core members του Angular Athens Meetup και μαζί δημιουργήσαμε τους Angularians. Είμαστε μία ΑΕ. Πλάκα κάνω. Με τον Φάνη γενικά τα λέμε για την Angular. Ανταλλάζουμε απόψεις του στυλ, τι library χρησιμοποιεί ο καθένας, ποια τεχνική μας δυσκόλεψε όταν πήγαμε να την εφαρμόσουμε. Ακόμα και κάτι καινούριο που ενδεχομένω να είδαμε σε κάποιο event, ή σε κάποιο online webinar. Οπότε λόγω του lockdown επικοινωνούσαμε περισσότερο από απόσταση και κουβεντιάζαμε αυτό που αγαπάμε, την Angular. Και εκεί ήρθε η ιδέα των Angularians. Γιατί να μην επεκτείνουμε τη συζήτησή μας και να μοιραστούμε όλα αυτά που συζητάμε μαζί σας. Τι σκεφτήκαμε λοιπόν, αφού μένουμε όλοι σπίτι λόγω της κατάστασης και ενδεχομένως μερικοί από εμάς να έχουμε ελεύθερο χρόνο, να καταγράψουμε όλες αυτές τις εμπειρίες μας στα βιντεάκια. Και να ανεβάζουμε περιοδικά βίντεο στο YouTube με στόχο να γίνουμε μία μεγάλη παρέα. Θα ανεβάσουμε το πρώτο μας βίντεο σύντομα και μην ξεχνάτε να γράφετε τα σχόλιά σας. Πού θα το ανακοινώσουμε? Στο Slack channel του Angular Athens Meetup. Γεια σας! Λοιπόν, λοιπόν, ακούστε. Κανονικά θα με σκοτώσει ο Φάνης που σας το λέω, αλλά στο πρώτο μας επεισόδιο θα περιγράψουμε τις εμπειρίες μας από το πρώτο Online NGConf Hardware. Μην το χάσετε. Right. Such a nice, uh, such a nice initiative by Funny Scenarios. And uh, I guess, Jorgos, you can take it from here. Yeah. So all the team is here. Katerina, Aris, Lena. Where are you? <laughs> okay, so I think we, we can say goodbye now. And uh, uh, Manfred, if you want to say uh, some things or goodbye or something? Yeah, just one more time. Thank you. It was really nice. And I hope I can visit you next time uh, directly in Athens when this Corona crisis is over. And yeah, have a nice day and all the best. Thank you. You too. Thank you, Thank you Manfred. Thank you. So bye all guys. Bye all guys. Bye, bye everyone. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, for attending. Thank you for watching. Yeah. Stay safe. Stay bye. safe. Yes, <laughs> Elena. <laughs> Boom. <laughs>